Good morning, everyone. Hope you all are doing good. Good start this morning. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Brad. Uh, appreciate all of you taking the time to be here. I think this is a great cause. Um, DPR Construction is proud to be associated with Maryland Tech Council and the Bioinnovation Conference. Our core uh, values of Ever Forward, focusing on improvement and advancement, aligns with Maryland Tech Council's mission of saving lives and improving the quality of life through innovation. DPR Construction um, has been recognized and ranked as number one by Engineering News Record in Pharmaceutical. And it has experience in building research and development facilities, drug manufacturing facilities, and cell and gene therapy uh, facilities, amongst others. DPR has a strong history in supporting NIH and building facilities that focus on improving life and human health. One such example is the NIH NCI building T30 Cell Processing Modular Facility Project, which won ENR's Best of the Best Award in Manufacturing category. This tumor infiltrating lymphocytes cell processing modular facility is the first large scale, fully prefab uh, prefabricated and modular multi module CGMP manufacturing facility of its kind ever built in the United States. The National Can Cancer Center Institute will utilize the facility to deliver cutting edge cancer treatment. With this, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Tara Schwetz, Acting Principal Deputy Director, National Institutes of Health. In 2021, Dr. Schwetz was on detail to the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy as the Assistant Director of Biomedical Science Initiatives. In this role, she led the efforts to stand up the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health, the Biden administration has proposed Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health to tackle some of the biggest health challenges facing Americans by driving medical innovation more rapidly. Dr. Schwetz has served as the Associated Deputy Director of NIH and the alternate Deputy Ethics Counselor for NIH. Throughout her nearly 10-year tenure at NIH, Dr. Schwetz has held multiple positions across several institutes and within the Office of Director. Dr. Schwetz has received a Bachelor of Science in Biochemistry with honors from Florida State University and a PhD in Biophysics from the University of South Florida, followed by a postdoctoral fellowship at Vanderbilt University. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Schwetz. everyone and thank you for inviting me here today uh, sounds like you guys have a big task ahead of you to break the internet and social media so <laughs> good luck with that um, I'm gonna take a few minutes though to talk to you about some of the initiatives that we have ongoing at NIH that are really focused on innovation let's see if I can get this clicker working okay there we go um, so first, I want to talk a little bit about our COVID-19 response and the efforts that we launched um, to help lead the research response efforts to the pandemic. It's been an it's been a interesting two and a half years. Okay. Uh, first, we'll focus on the uh, Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics program, or RADx, which is something that we launched back in April of 2020. If you recall back then, uh, the amount of diagnostic tests that were available were quite limited. You couldn't test yourself at home. Um, and so we launched RADx to really help push uh, advancement and innovation in the development, commercialization, and implementation of COVID-19 diagnostic tests. Now that we had a lot, we have a lot of different components of this, but I want to really highlight and focus on three. Notably, RADx Tech, which helped to, uh, to usher in uh, a, a, what we describe as sort of a, a, an innovation funnel. Um, it's a multi-phasic uh, challenge space that allows for the best candidates to move forward through this funnel and to really, again, get to the advancement and development of point of care and, and at-home diagnostic tests for COVID-19. It's sometimes referred as the shark tank. 
Um, we also launched an effort called RADx Underserved Populations, um, which is a big interlinked uh, community engaged uh, program that really helped to focus on the implementation of these tests, getting them to the people who, who needed them the most, and doing so in a way that uh, worked best for the setting and for the population. Um, and then finally, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, RADx RAD, which was trying to accelerate the development of non-traditional approaches to testing. I really want to just focus on what some of the accomplishments are from this program. But, but first, I will just give you kind of an overview of what the innovation funnel is. Um, so it is, it is a stage-gated program. It's multi-phasic. And, and as its name implies, right, it's an innovation funnel. It starts really wide opening with a lot of uh, applications that came through up to, I think we had yeah, 824 applications come through the funnel. Um, and the idea is to help rapidly validate and de-risk technologies that were being ushered through by bringing in teams of experts that could focus on things like the science and technology, uh, clinical, uh, folks that had clinical expertise, people that could weigh in to help address usability and accessibility issues, um, and also to think about some of the regulatory and commercialization requirements that were needed to advance these through to EUA. Okay, so some of the things that have come out of RADx Tech that we're really proud of are that there have been 45 EUAs granted to RADx Tech programs. Um, and in particular, and probably most notable, uh, the first um, at over-the-counter uh, EUA was granted for a RADx Tech program. That was for a, a Loom. And you can see here, of course, RADx Tech has contributed to the increased capacity of COVID-19 diagnostic text tests that are available. Right now, we can go to any sort of CVS or Walgreens or anywhere and pick up an antigen test. Um, and, and RADx Tech really helped to contribute to that, that capacity. Some of the other key uh, accomplishments of this program include setting up a sort of standardized reporting mechanism, this online digital porter, portal to allow people to upload their results. Um, it gives us a better sense of what, uh, you know, what the actual numbers are in the population for, for positive cases. We also have an effort that is supporting variant tracking. Uh, so that we can ensure that the diagnostics are able to, to detect new variants as they're arising. Um, and then finally, we have a component that's focused on test accessibility. So improvements in the usability of at-home tests, in particular for those with disability. Uh, and this just pretty much highlights uh, all of those accomplishments that I mentioned on the last slide. But I, I will uh, just uh, emphasize the point that all of the programs that have come through the RADx Tech program, there are still some that are in it. We are having a push to try to get those through uh, so that they can uh, put forward uh, their EUA. And so that is ultimately the goal with all of the RADx Tech programs. With RADx UP, um, again, it's the RADx Underserved Populations uh, program. Uh, I've been told by our director of the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities that it has the greatest diversity of any NIH initiative to date, something that we're very proud of. It includes over 24 different uh, populations, um, particularly uh, working with folks who are from underserved or COVID vulnerable populations. Um, and doing so uh, in every state in the nation, DC, uh, Puerto Rico, and a couple of the Pacific territories. To date, there have been over 315,000 participants that have been enrolled in RADx UP, and we've distributed almost 400,000 tests to these individuals. And I think one of the key components of this is that we're really working closely with the communities. So 127 of the projects in RADx UP collaborate with community partners. Now, RADx RAD was sort of kind of more forward-looking in its design, trying to, to implement uh, and develop, I should say, the next generation of diagnostic testing uh, to help us respond to not only this pandemic, but, but hopefully uh, future pandemics uh, that you know, might come down the pipe. We made 49 awards and are, have 61 in, uh, institutions that participate in this program. 
Um, and to date, they have filed uh, or been granted over 32 patents and uh, submitted three pre-EUAs. Pre um, so these, these are, again, more early stage tests, but we, we see a lot of potential in, in their development. And as you can see, they've been uh, fairly successful already in their activities over the last uh, couple of years. So shifting gears just a little bit, I want to take a moment to talk about um, the cancer moonshot, which is a priority for this administration and in particular for the president himself. So the cancer moonshot actually was originally launched back in 2016 under the Obama-Biden administration to help uh, you know, speed innovation in cancer research, mostly focusing on the transitional research, translational research space. They're trying, the, the goal was really to accelerate discovery, increase collaboration within the community, and to expand data sharing. In the, in the three years or so that it's been launched, it has uh, funded over 240 programs, launched about 50 clinical trials, and uh, filed over 30 patents. So building on the success of this first phase of the moonshot, uh, the, the current administration uh, decided to launch the second phase of the cancer moonshot. This we call it cancer moonshot 2.0. Um, and back in February, uh, the president announced this new initiative, or new phase of the initiative. And he announced three goals. The first is to cut the cancer death rate in half within 25 years. Uh, the second is to transform the meaning of cancer, what we think of when you get a cancer diagnosis. And the third is to address uh, cancer-associated inequities. So how can we uh, increase diversity in the clinical trials? How can we build uh, capacity? And specifically, there we go. Went way too far. There we go. Specifically, these three goals are supported by seven pillars. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them in detail, and you can see that the graphics have gotten misaligned <laughs> a little bit uh, on, on the on the slide, but, but essentially are focusing on helping to diagnose cancer sooner, uh, prevent cancer, um, address inequities, as I, as I mentioned before, to be sure that everyone has access to treatments um, and therapeutics, uh, diagnostic efforts, um, and to target treatments to the right, right patients so that they are getting individualized and personalized treatments. And then to speed progress against the red, uh, deadliest and rarest cancers Finally, to support patients and caregivers because there are a lot of burdens and hurdles that they have to overcome. And then finally, to learn from all patients so that we can try to end cancer as we know it today. Okay. Now, ARPA-H, which was mentioned uh, in, in the opening uh, remarks, uh, it is a new effort that we have been launching at NIH. It's the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health. And ARPA-H is going to tackle cancer research, but also many, many other things. The goal of ARPA-H is really to advance uh, research on expanding capabilities, technologies, platforms, things that can have a broad uh, scope and kind of lift all boats. And what's really novel about ARPA-H is the, the approach that we're taking to be able to support some of these health-related research efforts. So uh, back in the 50s, back in 1957, uh, the, the Russians launched a, a satellite called Sputnik, and that really took the US by surprise. Um, and so back then, they created DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, to ensure that we were never caught off guard again. Well, if you fast forward to 2019, I think we were kind of, some of us were caught off guard again um, uh, when the COVID-19 pandemic hit. But this time we were a little bit better prepared. We had decades of research able to support uh, and, and our understanding of you know, the virus, its structure, its mechanisms, um, you know, delivery mechanisms for vaccines as well as adjuvants that went in those vaccines. So we were a little better prepared. And in fact, there was a program manager at, at DARPA that asked the question uh, you know, a decade before, what happens if we could use mRNA to develop a vaccine or a therapeutic? Would it even work? 
Right, and he was able to do so, leveraging decade, these decades of, of research, mostly supported uh, by the National Institutes of Health. And what we saw, of course, was that we, we got a vaccine for COVID-19 in a record amount of time, 11 months, smashing all previous records. So just imagine what we could do with a focused effort on, uh, like this for ARPA-H on a variety of different other conditions, right? That is, the, that is what we want to try to do for ARPA-H, smash the current records. So how are we going to do this? We'll do this by utilizing uh, an approach that has been uh, pioneered at DARPA, uh, again, that legendary agency that was created in the wake of Sputnik. Um, and they're known for such minor things as the internet, <laughs> GPS. Um, and, and, and this approach has also been uh, utilized for other R&D sectors, such as energy and the intelligence community. And ARPA-H is going to try to empower every American to realize their health potential by creating and accelerating high-impact health solutions for well-defined problems to help demonstrate what health futures are possible for all. I just want to emphasize one point because ARPA-H is really going to focus on those well-defined problems. Um, you know, not sort of big pie in the sky, but very amorphous uh, questions really going to be bold and ambitious, but, um, but much more defined. Okay. Now, what makes an ARPA tick? We get asked this all the time. <laughs> so a variety of different things. First, uh, it's, it takes a program manager-centric mentality. So these program managers come to ARPA-H, and they will be responsible for developing a program from its inception and seeing it through and, until they leave, and they hope to get it to the point of, of its transition. And in fact, they're recruited to ARPA-H because of the ideas that they bring. Um, we could have a really great idea, but not have the right program manager, we're not gonna launch the program. The important thing about these program managers is that they need to be 100% mission focused and mission driven. So not, um, not focused on requirements or task driven uh, requests. And they'll do so under a lean and nimble organization that has a lot of autonomy and independence. Um, and, in, and embrace this sort of idea of high uncertainty high return. Think bold about the questions that are going to be asked. Demonstrate that you, know, you can move something from completely impossible to something that actually could be possible. And accept failure as part of the process. Normalize failure, right? Because if you're not failing occasionally, you're probably not being bold or risky enough in, in the types of questions that you're trying to uh, answer. And the program managers are gonna be actively involved in every aspect of the program. It's gonna be sort of like a partnership between them and the researchers. And finally, they're gonna um, embrace these sort of time-bound and urgent principles. So the programs, as well as the program managers themselves, will be time limited. They're gonna have a, a fi finite endpoint. Right? Uh, at DARPA, they say they get their, their badge and on their badge, there's an expiration date. And every day, they check it, they see that badge when they put it in their computer, and they see that expiration date. And they know that's how much time they have to, to get a program launched and out the door and have it be successful. So we're embracing that same approach with ARPA-H. And of course, being held accountable through multiple mechanisms that include things like stage gating um, and, and technical gates. Again, not being uh, afraid to sort of make the hard decision to shut down a program or, or to, to change it because of the way that things are evolving with the, with the science or the tech at the time. And every decision at ARPA-H will be informed by something called the Heilmeyer questions. So these questions were developed back in the 70s by a DARPA uh, director called George, named George Heilmeyer. Um, and DARPA in particular holds these very, very dear. They're sometimes called the Heilmeier Catechism. I mean, it, you know, 
you hold very tightly to these Heilmeier questions. They help you determine what, what programs you're going to launch. You have to run through these as part of your pitch to the director and the deputy director to make a determination about whether something is going to move forward. Now, they include sort of uh, somewhat basic questions like, what problem are you trying to solve? But also, like, how are, how are things done right now? Who's doing it? What, what are the limitations of the current approaches? And my personal favorite is, who cares? Why are we wanting to do this? You know, what difference is it actually going to make? And at ARPA-H, we're proposing an amendment. Of course, it's subject to uh, the director's <laughs> approval. Um, but uh, that is, how can we help ensure that the outcomes are equitable so that we can build equity in from the very beginning of the program development? OK, so back in March or so, uh, Congress passed the uh, FY22 uh, Consolidated Appropriations Act. That gave the federal government its resources for the current fiscal, well, what was, I guess, now, uh, now is the past fiscal year, uh, since we just started a new fiscal year um, uh, this over the weekend. But it, that bill gave ARPA-H um, a couple things. One, it turned it in, it, it created it. it it made it uh, into existence, went from a concept or idea into an actual uh, entity. It also gave a billion dollars to ARPA-H to get going and made it available over three years. This provides a lot of flexibility, especially with a brand new agency to get up and running. It also uh, placed it within the Department of Health and Human Services. And so ARPA-H is located within the, the National Institutes of Health, but it clarified one thing. It said the ARPA-H director is going to be a presidential appointee. And so the secretary determined that the ARPA-H director should have a direct reporting line to the HHS secretary, because he wanted to sort of emphasize the importance of this agency um, across the department, uh, while uh, also enabling its connection to the National Institutes of Health. And finally, the other thing that the bill did was it provided great uh, flexibility in terms of hiring and compensation. So we need to recruit program managers that are sometimes called the unicorns. They are people who are great scientific experts and visionary thinkers. But they also understand how to run and manage a program. And also, we can use this authority to hire key other members uh, of the team. And this includes people who can help us develop contracts, get the money out the door. Uh, because as I always say, you can have the best idea, but if you can't get the money out the door, then it doesn't really matter. And we're really excited that just a couple weeks ago, the president announced his intent to appoint um, Renee Wegerson, Dr. Renee Wegerson, as the inaugural director of ARPA-H. Now she's coming to us from uh, Ginkgo Bioworks, uh, and before that, she was a program manager at DARPA. And a few months ago, uh, we uh, welcomed Dr. Adam Russell as the acting deputy director of ARPA-H. He, w before that, he was a program manager at both DARPA and IARPA. So these two individuals, they really understand the model that we're trying to embrace with ARPA-H. We're really excited to see what they're going to do over the next couple weeks, because Renee is starting uh, very, very soon. <laughs> Hopefully next week. We'll see. Now, looking forward into the future, I want to sort of take a step back and look at the larger bi biomedical ecosystem, uh, as well as NH's role in it. And a couple months ago, over the summer, uh, Dr. Larry Tabak, who is performing the duties of the NIH director, don't ask, it's a long story, <laughs> with the Vacancies Act, but, but basically he's our, he's our acting uh, NIH director for all intents and purposes. And he outlined a few things that, uh, that really keep him up at night. And, and I would just want to mention two of them here. First is that NIH uh, supports you know, a wide range of institutions. But over the last many, many years, uh, the, fund, the bulk of our funding, over 36%, is now going to the top 20 institutions. That, what that means in terms of PIs or, or principal investigators is that 10% of our PIs are getting about 40% of our resources. 
Uh, and this is just illustrated uh, another way here. And we know that there are really great scientists at institutions beyond those top 20 universities that are doing really excellent work. And we want to try to think about how we can continue to expand our reach to those investigators. The other thing that uh, is of critical importance to NIH is building the trust in science. And I think over the last two and a half years uh, with the pandemic, we learned a lot of things. It highlighted a lot of different things. And one of them is that you know, there's a lot of misinformation in and about science. And so you know, NIH hopes to try to continue to build on efforts to uh, build up the trust in science. So with that, um, I thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to connect with you all. Um, and I think we have a couple minutes for questions, um, if there are any questions. I don't know where. I see a hand up in the back. Yeah, no, that's a great question. And I didn't mention, all, obviously, all of the COVID-19 efforts that we have. But uh, you know, a couple years ago, we launched, I think actually technically last year, we launched the Recover effort, which is uh, focusing a billion dollars on research into long COVID. There's a lot that we do not understand about long COVID right now. And that effort is really helping to catalyze our understanding. You know. Uh, understanding of the risks, who's going to develop uh, long COVID and, and why, and sort of better do a lot of better characterization. Like, we don't even really have a great definition of long COVID. And so that's some of the work that that recover effort is going to do. And I mentioned RADx RAD, and RADx RAD and Recover have a combined effort currently right now. They just launched a challenge to try to develop um, some diagnostic tools to try to predict who might develop long COVID. Great, thanks. I saw another, yeah, hand. Sure, I, and just to make sure I understand, you're talking about for ARPA-H? Yeah. About, so just, uh, I, just for folks on, online, I suppose, the question is, who's, who's going to be applying for ARPA-H, essentially? That's the, the short version. Um, yeah, so we hope that it, anyone who has a really good idea is going to apply to the program announcements that come out for ARPA-H, whether that's companies um, or academic investigators or you know, kind of a whole host of, of other um, folks who might be able to contribute. And in particular, uh, we think that industry partners are going to be critical for ARPA-H, right? The idea that we want to perpetuate with ARPA-H is to be able to get um, something over the finish line. So whether that's creating a proof of concept or getting something to a place where it has you know, already received FDA approval or some sort of EUA, depending on what, what of course, is focused on. Um, and I think industry partners are going to be very critical for that. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, John Troyer from Verimune. Um, kind of a follow-up question. Um, you mentioned uh, getting the money out the door. Uh, what is the mechanism? Uh, is it going to be uh, RFPs, uh, requirements with timed proposals, that type of thing? Can you talk a little bit about the, the mechanism? 
Yeah, so generally the approach that we're going to take with ARBA-H, and I should, I should be clear, we haven't put anything out yet because, as I indicated, Renee, who is the inaugural director, starts soon, so she's not even here yet. Uh, but but she's going to be she's going to have a big responsibility and task to be able to uh, very clearly outline the scientific vision for ARPA H and its priorities and quickly get some broad agency announcements, which is going to be the mechanism out the door. Now we're going to the approach that ARPA H is going to use is not going to be to fund grants. It will fund contracts. It will use other transaction authorities. It may use um, cooperative agreements. Uh, to make awards with folks, but it's really going to be um, utilizing mechanisms that we hope provide a lot more flexibility and that have uh, that extra like sense of engagement, I guess, between the program managers and the awardees. Wonderful talk. So I'm Angela Stoyanovich, flew in from North Carolina representing a bioanalytical CRO. I'm also the host of Legal Drugs Podcast. I wanted to ask you about your last slide about trust. Um, and, and also as a woman, um, you know, one of the things that I think in our communities, our families, our friends, when we went through COVID that we had to overcome was this idea that people do not know what it takes to get a drug to market, in particular for those of us who develop therapies, right? So how do we um, educate the communities we live in on what that really means? Um, and if, if you could maybe address some of the trust um, initiatives that you guys are looking into and tie that into um, diagnostics because when you started talking about COVID in the red X, just before the pandemic, uh, the, the JP Morgan Biotech Showcase in San Francisco was talking a lot about diagnostics and how we're really missing some key diagnostic tools for women. So back to women's health. Um, I held off on getting the vaccine because reproductive toxicology components had not been completed uh, in the initial stage of you know, releasing these vaccines, right? So even having a 15 year industry, a, a career in this industry, I knew that there were components that were important to me so how do we, in the capital of our country, you know, not only take that seriously, but um, talk about how do we get funding into this, these diagnostic spaces? And then if we're gonna develop a vaccine, how do we know if it's really safe for us? And what are we doing to engage with trust? So sort of a three-tiered question, if you will. <laughs> However you wanna take it. <laughs> Thank you. I'll see if I can try to, to answer yeah. all, all of that. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, no, uh, you know, NIH in particular, and that, that's what I'll focus on, is, is launching several efforts to try to help a, address some of the, the questions that you raise and, and has many ongoing activities as well. Um, so first, I'll, I'll mention a, a, a Common Fund effort. So the Common Fund is, is a program that we have within our Office of the Director that helps to try to uh, address uh, cross-cutting questions across the entire agency, so across all of our 27 institutes and centers. These are 10-year programs, and we're launching one on health communication. So um, how basically to, to understand the sort of research components around how we can better communicate about health um, and health research. So that's one of the mechanisms we're tackling. Of course, um, uh, not necessarily directly tied to NIH activities, but there have been over the last maybe 10 to 15 years kind of a, 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 a surge of interest, I think, in the training programs to be able to um, help promote like science communication amongst the trainees. And I think what hopefully we'll see, we are hopefully starting to see, and what we will continue to see is scientists that are coming out of grad school and postdoc that are uh, better able to communicate really complicated scientific principles and distill them in a way that makes you know sense to, to anyone that they're talking to. Um, the other thing, you, you asked a little bit about uh, some of the efforts that we have uh, to address sort of essentially what we call sex as a biological variable. Um, and we launched an initiative, goodness, maybe uh, six or seven years ago, 
uh, to really uh, emphasize the importance of sex, uh, consideration of sex as a biological variable in um, a lot of the different programs that we fund and support. And so that effort is ongoing. Um, it's something that people have to justify if they're not including <laughs> females, if they're excluding females from research. Why? And it has to make scientific sense. It can't just be like, well, we're going to have to, you know, you, you know, need more animals or, or it's going to require longer to do uh, because it's going to take us a little bit longer to recruit. That's not a reasonable uh, explanation. So um, I hope, I think I answered most of your questions, but, uh, uh, but there's a lot more that uh, obviously can be done in, in both of those spaces. I don't know how we're doing on time, um, but uh, I think maybe one more question. If there are questions. Hi, I'm Kirsten Hildebrand from Children's National Research Institute. I have some question. Given the cost of building out life science space um, and the need to accelerate scientific discovery, would the NIH ever consider making their co facility available for people in the Maryland district of Washington, D.C., and Virginia area? Yeah, well, we have a lot of partnerships with uh, you know, universities and um, institutions in the area. And so that's one of the ways that, that we um, are able to kind of, uh, you know, I guess, collaborate with, effectively with the community. Um, our intramural program also has, in particular, a lot of uh, close relationships with some of the universities and, um, and hospitals in the area. Uh, in particular, I know we have a, 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 a robust relationship with Children's National. Um, because we, we currently do not have as robust a program in the pediatric space in our clinical center as I think many people would like. And so that is one mechanism that we are able to enhance uh, that, uh, that pool of, uh, of patients that we're able to access. Okay, well with that, um, I thank you so much for uh, listening to me talk about some of the exciting work that we have ongoing at NIH and for your thoughtful questions. And um, really appreciate it. I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, the organizers. Thank you.